It's been 60 years since my own university days, and um, I'm very delighted to be here today with you at Warwick. I'm never sure how to start, but perhaps I'll start by saying that I grew up in a medical household. My parents were both physicians, and my older brothers became physicians, and uh, the table talk was always of medicine and always presented in the form of stories. Um, so I can hardly imagine medicine without medical stories. My extended family, um, my uncles and aunts, were largely in the physical sciences, and my own first passion was for chemistry. Um, but here again, stories were all important for me. The story of Humphrey Davy using electricity to get the alkali metals, um, the story of how the periodic table was dreamed one night and then written on the back of an envelope the next day. And I think the hunger for narrative, for stories, is, has been very strong for me but also, I think, is, is a necessity for everyone. By the way, having mentioned chemistry, I am, I am pleased to see two lithium atoms on the university crest, apparently two isotopes of lithium. I don't know what they're doing, but I'm happy to see them there, along with DNA at the top. Um, when I went to medical school, uh, when I went to hospital in London, to the Middlesex Hospital, which now, alas, is not only defunct, but has been replaced by, by a very ugly apartment building, um, I, I retain very little memory of medical lectures there. On the other hand, I remember all the patients I saw with vividness and, and affection. Um, I'm not able to learn except in a hands-on way or in the context of a, a relationship. One patient comes to mind. Uh, the professor of medicine has said to me, Sachs, there's a delirium in room six. Go see it. He felt that this would... Um, this sort of talk is common in hospitals. One has the, the appendix in room eight. This was a delirium in room six. Uh, there was no mention of, of the person who had the delirium. Um, but I found, as I would have found from his delirium, um, I found that he was a tea planter who would spend much of his life in what was then called Ceylon. And in his delirium, there was a continuous surging of memories of his life, of his ambitions, his patterns, all sorts of events. And I was fascinated by this man, and I spent hours listening to him. It was almost like being privy to a dream. Um, and in his delirium, he really disgorged an entire autobiography. Um, and perhaps everything that a psychoanalysis might have produced as well. And so a delirium was intensely personal. He was not a delirium in room six. When I was finished with my training days and came to New York, I first of all joined a migraine clinic. Um, the I had thought that this might be very dull. One feels migraine is not very exotic. But um, I found it was quite the reverse. Um, migraine can provide an amazing window into the nervous system, especially in what's called the migraine aura, when one can have complex hallucinations of various sorts. Um, but also, um, I was prevented from getting too preoccupied neurologically by the fact that the patients were 
telling me stories and telling me stories of their sufferings and how they, how they dealt with migraine one way and another. Um, Osler, the great Canadian physician, used to say, ask not what disease the patient has, but rather what person the disease has. And I found it almost impossible to treat migraine unless I learned something of the person who had it and, um, and their lives. And if I didn't learn enough, there would be trouble. For example, there was one patient who had migraines every Sunday. I thought this is a common pattern. He'd never had any specific treatment. I uh, gave him some treatment. I told him that as soon as he saw the, the scintillations of migraine, he should put this tablet under his tongue and, and uh, the rest wouldn't develop. Um, he came back to me in a, um, in a very peculiar mixed mood. He said that the tablet had worked beautifully and there was no more migraine, but this had affected his life and his creativity in a peculiar and adverse way. Normally, he said, and this was not something which I'd learned straight away, normally the migraine he would have on Sunday would clear the decks of emotional debris and it was a sort of catharsis of mind and body. And he was a mathematician and a very good mathematician. He would have a huge surge of creativity after the migraine, which would carry him through Monday and Tuesday. He'd be a little bit off on Wednesday. Thursday and Friday would be worse. Saturday would be intolerable. He'd, he was too tense to work. He didn't have any thinking. And then on Sunday, the migraine would explode. It would be very severe, but it would clear the decks, as I've said. And now I had prevented the migraine. I had prevented his mathematics. And he said he wanted the mathematics, even if it cost him a migraine. And so this gave me some idea of the economy of an individual and how one had to inquire what a particular symptom meant, how it might be employed, how it related to the rest of their life. Uh, this is my favorite little bottle. And um, if I wrap it in brown paper, pe people su suspect the worst. They, they say, I'm shameless drinking in public, like that. Um, the, I, I wanted to delve into the literature on migraine, the medical literature, and um, I looked at many papers um, which were full of statistics and full of data of one sort and another, but almost none of them gave me any sense of the individuals there. And I had to go back and, um, uh, and back and back until I came to a book written in the 1860s um, called On Megrim um, by uh, an English physician called Edward Living. I loved this book because um, all the patients were presented as individuals. You learn something about their family, what work they did, their occupations, how they dealt with their migraines. Um, and it was as easy to read as a novel. Um, in a way, it consisted of... Um, Wittgenstein sometimes said a book should consist of examples. This did consist of examples, and the examples were the case histories, the stories, the miniature biographies of these patients, and biographies which were so vivid that one could picture the 1860s and some of, some of London's labor and poor, as Mayhew described it, through Living's book. Um, that book was an inspiration to me and um, 
because now it was the 1960s and I felt one should have a book like that and um, who was going to write it? Um, well, I, uh, a very loud inner voice said, you silly bugger, you're the man. And I was the man and so I wrote my first book on migraine. Um, it sounds like a silly little subject, but it was, it was really my own apprenticeship in medicine, and, and it confirmed a passion for detailed case histories, detailed human stories, um, and a feeling that these might have been at their strongest in the 19th century. Um, it was, um, I think, some of our division between technical and popular is relatively recent. And if you go back, say, to Darwin, um, uh, um, the origin or the fertilization of orchids or any of Darwin's books um, are as easy and delightful to read as novels. They are non-fiction novels. They contain science, but science is embedded in, in stories. And that seemed to me an ideal. Um, the, um, incidentally, I was just captivated by uh, the proof of a book which was sent to me. The title of the book was A Tale of Seven Elements. And I was asked if I would write a foreword to it. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the title and actually said I'd be happy to write a foreword before I open the book. But, um, I, but here again, this was chemistry as narrative. Stories of discovery and of quarrels about priority and mistakes and illusions and triumphs, everything. Uh, chemistry as a, as a human story, a social story. Um, at the same time as starting in this migraine clinic, I started work in a chronic disease hospital in New York, in the Bronx, and I was very startled when I walked through the doors of the hospital because I saw dozens of people standing around, motionless, transfixed, some of them like statues, some of them in odd postures. Um, and um, I learned that these, many of these patients had been there for decades, some of them from the 1920s, and that the hospital had been opened in 1920 for the first victims of what was then called the sleepy sickness or the epidemic encephalitis. Some of these people were, um, were excited and had all sorts of involuntary movements in the early days, but they then tended to freeze and in, into this uh, almost catatonic state in which I saw them. Um, and um, I was told that no medication and no surgical approach could do anything for them. Um, I wondered, of course, what was going on inside, if anything was going on inside, um, if anything was happening inside them. Um, when I asked the nurses, uh, nurses tend to know much more than doctors about patients in chronic disease hospitals. They're with the patients all the while. The nurses said they were convinced that all of these people were alive and sensitive inside and that sometimes this could be brought out by music and that people who couldn't speak uh, or move might be able to sing and dance if they were given music, but this would stop as soon as the music stopped. Um, in 1966, when I went there, there was no medical way of treating them. The following year, a medication became available um, called L-DOPA, and 
L-DOPA is a precursor of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which is necessary for movement, not only for physical movement, but for mental movement and emotional movement. And these stuck, frozen people had almost no dopamine in their nervous system. Um, the um, effects of giving it were very, very startling and often very sudden. Um, um, as, as Nigel mentioned, Harold Pinter wrote a play um, about one of these patients called A Kind of Alaska. Um, actually, I got a, a fascinating letter from Harold Pinter. He said that when Awakenings had been, was published in 1973, he thought it had dramatic possibilities, but he couldn't think what to do with these. And he then put it out of his mind and forgot it for seven years. But that the previous summer in 1980, he had a dream. He couldn't remember what the dream was, but when he woke up, he saw in his mind's eye a scene and the words which went with the scene. Uh, it was the first scene of a play of which the first words were, something is happening. And something started happening on an immense scale with all 80 of the patients who were under my care. Um, and it was um, uh, the, first, the first effects of this were, were lyrical and wonderful. Uh, people who had never had any hope of, of release suddenly finding themselves able to, to move and to talk and to feel. Feeling had been frozen as well. And it was at this stage that I learned from their lips, from their own lips, some of their stories. I was very puzzled by one patient who kept talking about Gershwin and others who were alive in the 1920s, and I wondered if she was disoriented. She was a, a bright woman, and um, you will see her in a couple of days, I think, if you, when you see the video, uh, the documentary film of, of Awakenings. But she was a bright woman. She said, um, I feel it's 1926, but I know it's 1969. I feel I'm 21, but I know I'm 64. And she said that the intervening 43 years, um, she had not been asleep, she had not been unconscious, but nothing held together. Nothing had any meaning in that time. And for this patient, as for almost all the others, they had dropped as through a vacuum from their 20s to their 60s, from the 1920s to the 1960s. Um, now, I um, had learned from migraine experiences, but now the lesson was to become much stronger that medicine can't be reduced to giving a medication, to giving medicine. Um, although, um, physiologically, uh, all of these patients could be immensely helped by the L-DOPA. Um, all of them were faced with anachronism. They had come to, in their 60s, the world had changed beyond meaning, and what did life, what could life, hold for them now? And it became a question of helping each person construct a life, uh, find activities and relationships which had meaning and uh, gave pleasure and were productive. And um, so, in a way, the, the greater endeavor of medicine came home to me then. Um, uh, these patients um, were very conscious of having been put away and isolated, and in some cases abandoned by their families. Um, and uh, 
and having fallen out of consciousness. Incidentally, there were no accounts from 1935 onwards of the later stages of this strange disease, which was why I was bewildered and dumbfounded when I came into the hospital and saw these, these transfixed people. They said to me, tell our stories. And, um, and where in my first book, in Migraine, I'd only told little vignettes, um, here I told stories which, without intruding too much into what should be kept private, um, were really like biographies. I think a biographic mode of presentation is essential and basically Awakening consisted of 20 biographies. When the book came out in 1973, it had a very strange mixed reception. Um, it was uh, greeted uh, by the general public and by many reviewers. Um, it was selected as the Observer Book of the Year by five people. But on the other hand, um, there was not a single notice in the medical literature. Um, there was a strange mutism from my colleagues, as if I had um, somehow departed from scientific integrity. Um, uh, Freud, speaking about his case histories, wrote, it still strikes me as strange that the case histories I write should read like short stories, and that, as others might say, they lack the serious stamp of science. I think this was very much the feeling about Awakenings when it came out. Um, and I was very pleased, therefore, to weigh against this the opinion of the colleague I valued most in the world. And although I never met him, I, he had influenced me immensely, and I revered him. And this was A.R. Luria, the neuropsychologist in Russia. And Luria wrote me a letter. He said, I was ever conscious and sure that a great clinical description of cases plays a leading role in medicine, especially in neurology and psychiatry. Unfortunately, the ability to describe, which was so common to the great neurologists and psychiatrists of the 19th century, is lost now, perhaps because of the basic mistake that mechanical and electrical devices can replace the study of personality. He said, your book shows that the important tradition of clinical case studies can be revived and with a great success. Um, this uh, was even more meaningful to me because a book which Luria himself had published in 68 was in some ways a model for me. Uh, Luria liked to talk about classical science and romantic science. In classical science, giving formal models of physiology and, and what goes on in the brain, uh, Louis had published books with titles like Higher Cortical Functions in Man. Um, but then, um, and he waited till he was in his 60s before he did this, then he wrote a remarkable book, or two remarkable books, um, the one in 68 was called The Mind of an Eminist. Uh, an Eminist is someone with a, an extraordinary memory. I read about 30 pages of this thinking it was a novel. And then I realized that it wasn't, that it was a case history. And the most beautiful and deep and detailed I'd ever seen, but a case history with the pathos, the poignancy and the drama and all the feeling of a novel. So, in a way, it was a non-fiction novel. And, and for me, um, which could show science and storytelling as complementary, 
and not, and not as antithetical. Um, oh, uh, I think I, while well, I'm in a quoted mood, um, there's one other quote, if I can find it. Um, well, uh, um, by Mackenzie, who was a physician who in the 1920s saw people in the early stages of this disease. And he said, the physician is concerned, unlike the naturalist, with a single organism, the human subject, striving to preserve its identity in adverse circumstances. And I love that phrase about striving to preserve identity. It's, it's used in common language. We speak of people battling with cancer or possibly succumbing to, to melancholia or whatever, but it's not just the disease, it is how the disease or damage is experienced, its impact on the person, their response to it, their ability perhaps to adapt or to find other ways of doing things. And so, um, for me, um, although diagnosis, and if there's any specific treatment, comes first, for me, that's not the end of the story, it's the beginning. And the real problem is how to, how to, how to find a more tenable life. Uh, the experience of awakenings was not to be repeated. And I've never again found myself with a group of 70 or 80 people uh, with a remarkable illness, all of whom, most of whom, converted at the same time. But over the years, I've seen patients with many, many other conditions, um, such as Dr. P, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Um, this title, which um, sounds somewhat facetious, is in fact literally true. And Dr. P um, had visual agnosia. He saw clearly, but he didn't know what he was seeing. And um, on, on, on one occasion, uh, he went for his hat and got his wife's head. Um, the, although when I made my clinical note at the time saying this, I had no idea that it would become the title of a, a tale, let alone a book of clinical tales. Um, uh, Dr. P was, um, he had been a musician, and his wife was a musician. They were very gifted opera singers, both of them. And um, uh, although Dr. P was helpless visually and in the visual world, um, if um, objects and events could be tied to a tune, uh, then this would organize him. And basically the entire day was spent singing. There were dressing songs and eating songs and washing songs and songs of every sort. Um, the Much more recently, I wrote about another musician. I seem to see a lot of musicians. A superb pianist, some of you may have heard of her, Lillian Kalia, who also developed a visual agnosia. With her, the first thing to go wrong was she was, became unable to read music. She'd been a superb sight reader, and that disappeared. Then she became unable to read newsprint. Um, she couldn't read, but she could write perfectly. And she wrote me a letter telling me about this. I got the letter in, in 99, and, um, uh, and she came to see me um, when I gave her all sorts of test drawings and to see if she could recognize things she did extremely badly and um, and then after she left I, I couldn't find my medical bag uh, 
but she came back a few minutes later saying, I'm the woman who mistook the doctor's bag for her own bag. Uh, she saw my red-tipped reflex hammer peeping out of the bag, and she was extremely sensitive to color, um, extremely and life-savingly. I wondered how someone who was so agnosic could lead a normal life, but she was giving concerts at the time, uh, she was teaching at the Juilliard School of Music. Um, how does she get along? I had to make a house visit. Um, I think it's crucial for doctors, general doctors at least, to make house visits. Um, when my father was 90, he was still practicing medicine, and we said, Pop, give up the house calls. And he said, no, I'll give up everything else, but I'll keep the house calls. And I, I, I love neurological house calls and sort of seeing the world which people live in. And with Lillian, um, everything in the apartment was organized in terms of color and size. Um, and... Um, uh, even though it couldn't be recognized in the usual way. It made me think of, of how an illiterate person might organize pages from a book. Um, but she did extremely well there. Um, she also found, of course, she was no longer able to look at scores and to increase her repertoire by this but she found her musical memory and her musical powers increasing. Um, I learned of this rather suddenly when she played something which puzzled me because it, it was and it wasn't familiar. And I said, what's that? And she said that the day before she'd listened to a Haydn string quartet and she had re rearranged it in her mind for piano. And this was the piano version. She says she could never have done such a thing before without using pencil and paper. And, um, and this again uh, was a lovely example of how as some problems, as some things get worse, other things may get better and take their place. Um, the yet another patient, I don't, um, uh, I hesitate to use the word patient because this was such an independent man, um, uh, was a, a gifted novelist who described how one morning he had come down, had breakfast, things seemed fine. He saw the newspaper, which was the Toronto Globe and Star, on the doorstep. And that looked fine at a distance, but when he picked it up, he could make nothing of it. He couldn't read it. It seemed to be in some bizarre other language. Um, he thought it might be in Korean or, or Serbo-Croat. His first thought was that the Toronto Globe and Star had put out a special small edition for an ethnic minority in Toronto, and he got one of these by mistake. His second thought was that his friends were playing a practical joke on him. But his third thought, when he saw that everything, including the advertisements, were unintelligible, was that something had gone wrong with his brain. And when he went into his library, uh, he could read nothing. Although, like Lillian, he could write perfectly well. Um, he hoped, um, well, he was found to have sustained a small stroke in a particular part of the brain which is involved in reading, though not in writing. Um, and he hoped that this would get better by itself, but it didn't seem to. Um, but what did happen um, 
and perhaps I should put, um, I'm not quite sure how to put this, he did in fact seem to be able to read a little bit sometimes. And then he realized that what was happening at these times was that his finger was tracing what his eye was seeing. And in effect, by copying, he was writing with his finger. And since he could write, though not read, he was reading by writing. And later still, uh, and this was quite unconscious, and it increased the speed of, of the pseudo-reading, he would trace the shapes of words with his tongue on the back of his teeth. And um, uh, this was not something he invented, it was a spontaneous invention, if you want, a spontaneous adaptation of the nervous system. Um, and um, I'd never heard of people reading with their tongue, their teeth, but he has become you know, well able to do this. And he has since written a beautiful memoir of his own illness and two more of the, of the um, crime novels for which he is noted. Um, the... Um, I, I have written the stories, I suspect, of scores and possibly two or three hundred people. Um, and I, I can't bend your ear too much, but you'll find them in my books. Um, I, I do want to come back to, to some general notions now. Uh, for many years, I also worked in a psychiatric hospital, a state hospital, as a neurologist. When I went there in 66, I was um, fascinated by many of the old charts on patients who might have been in hospital for 20 or 30 years. The charts were richly, beautifully descriptive um, uh, of, of how inner life and imagination might be in these people, as well as their behavior. Um, but then in 1980, uh, something happened. Um, and all of a sudden, these beautiful, careful, detailed, uh, empathetic descriptions were replaced by a mean list of criteria which would allow a diagnosis. This coincided with the publication of, it has its uses, but I want to call it an abominable book, uh, called the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the DSM. And the DSM provided diagnostic criteria for all sorts of psychiatric conditions and neurological ones too. And um, physicians were under pressure to use these criteria to make, make a diagnosis. Otherwise, they um, could not charge for seeing the patient. Now, I have nothing against criteria and such criteria, um, but uh, an itemization, a list of criteria, can't replace a full description or a story. And there's a great danger, at least in America, and especially in psychiatry, that it is doing so. And that the, uh, and that the great and elaborate sort of case history, uh, which, um, whose demise or Luria was already worried about when he wrote to me in 73, one has even more reason to be worried about it now. Um, doctors may say they don't have time to write a case history, um, but, but one does have time. Uh, a deep and detailed case history doesn't have to be long. If one uses language properly, it can be a couple of paragraphs, but you have to use language properly. Um, and um, diseases and the effects of damage are the same now 
as they were for Hippocrates 2,400 years ago, or for the writers of the Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus in 3000 BC. If one looks at that, there are translations available, you know exactly what is happening. So disease hasn't changed and people haven't changed. And I think it's unlikely that in relation to disease, they will change. But whatever happens, one has to have good narrative, good description with a person at the center and with a complete integration of, of the science and the storytelling. And that's my thesis for today. Thank you very much.